Well, so it was 100% retention due to performance. And no, there are definitely times that we made mistakes, but we really focus on learning from those mistakes, making it better. Uh, there's four things you need to do. You need to win new business, keep that business, grow that business, and innovate. You know, a couple things. One, if there's 120,000 agencies in the United States, I'd spend a lot more time really understanding what makes us unique and what makes us different. For today's episode of Coffee with Closers, I'm sitting down with John Morris, former founder and CEO of Rice Interactive, a renowned digital marketing agency. John's expertise in digital landscape and innovative strategies propelled Rice Interactive to help businesses achieve remarkable growth. Now, as co-founder of Ramsey Innovations, John is revolutionizing the marketing communication industry by providing tech-enabled solutions for agency-focused budgeting, media reconciliation, resource planning, and more. His extensive experience and business acumen make him an invaluable resource for professionals in marketing. So stay tuned for a conversation with John. Hey, John, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. So excited to be here, Sam. Thanks for having me. Most certainly. Obviously, John, every entrepreneur has an interesting story of how they overcame obstacles to become an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm sure you have some very interesting stories. Uh, people who may not be uh, may not have heard of you, uh, you've had a very successful uh, agents, digital marketing agency in the Chicagoland area, pretty well known in the space and rapidly grew and, and you had a successful exit and now you're on to, uh, agency was called Rice Interactive, now you're on to uh, building a tech enabled a consulting company uh, called Ramsey Solutions, uh, who's, uh, which is basically focused on helping agencies that are upwards of 5 million or more uh, with their financial modeling and things of that nature. So you had a great success uh, building multiple companies and having had exits and things like that. Can you share with our audience a little bit about your journey as an entrepreneur? Absolutely. So I actually started my first company two days after I graduated college. Uh, so I spent one day to move and then I started a company called Net Traffic and it was in the mid 1990s. Uh, couldn't get a job. So I, I actually didn't know much about computers, but I was nerdy enough that people thought I did. And so I started developing the ugliest websites you've ever seen. And I was developing those websites. People kept on asking me, well, how's my website going to get found? I didn't know the answer. I was 22 years old. And to be honest, no one knew the answer because it was 1996. And so I quickly shifted to focusing on digital marketing and really was one of the pioneers of the entire space. I grew that agency to about 10 people and made enough money to never make any money. That's the way I like to think about it. Uh, ended up becoming a dot-com casualty, closed the doors. And, and the reason why I bring that up is because uh, for the longest period of time, I, I blamed the dot-com crash for that. But in reality, I don't think I managed my finances well, and I don't think I managed my people well. And so when I decided to start Rise, I used that as a big reflection point of what was I going to do differently when I ran Rise. And I, I've played sports my whole life. Uh, soccer was what I played through college. And when you think about business, I think of it as the ultimate team sport. And so I really was focused in Rise of putting all-star team together, only having A players, being absolutely focused on that and ended up having a huge success. Where my business today really got the insights from, from Rise, was if you think about it, there's 120,000 agencies just in the United States. Only 4% of them ever make it over 50 people. And all we have is time and money. So if you're thinking about how you spend your time and how you spend your money, and you think about how your competitor spends their time and their money, someone is going to spend their time and their money more efficiently, more effectively, and be able to scale and grow because of that. And I was religiously focused on this and built a budgeting and forecasting methodology with really a very simple framework of three KPIs to look at that allowed me to determine how am I doing against what I'm trying to set out to do. So today we've actually pivoted a little bit in terms of what you thought we did. We are really business intelligence and budgeting and forecasting software for agencies today. And so we only focus on the technology side, but it's to help people understand like, what are those three metrics that they should be looking at and how do they spend their time and money relative to their competition so that they can get an edge and grow from there. Yeah. So I think, you know, every successful entrepreneur has some failures. And so that's clearly your story as well. Most people probably know from the success of Rise Interactive, I, would, I think the time you exited was well over 150 employees and pretty sizable 
uh, operation in the Chicagoland area. Uh, now I think it's well over 500 people or something at that company too, right? And I'm pretty- Yep, so when I left, it was 250 and today it's over 500, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so it doubled in size even after that. So a pretty, pretty successful story there. So you said you learned two big lessons. One was not knowing your numbers and not having the right people in the team. So can you elaborate on that? Because that seems to be the, the ingredient for most uh, business success or failure there. Yeah, so a couple of things. I mentioned before that you know, business is the greatest team sport. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, if you play any sports at all, but, you know, you're generally as strong as your weakest link on your team. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, especially earlier on, like if you have 10 employees and one of them is not performing well, that's 10% of your workforce that's underperforming. Mm -hmm. And so I was adamant about really trying to hire the best talent. We actually created an analytics exam. It had a 22% pass rate. You weren't even allowed to interview unless you passed the test. And so we took the quality of the team at, at, to the highest level. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is, you know, there's all these different KPIs you could look at it. And it's really interesting. I, uh, there is this world that the Rise Interact is live in, which focuses more on the metrics that large companies and private equity companies use, which focuses on like your net revenue, your gross margin, uh, what percent of your revenue is your SGNA? And, and there's kind of like a standard language in that group. And now that I've, you know, helping a lot of smaller agencies, there's a lot of consultants that are giving them completely different metrics to follow. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think they're necessarily the right metrics to follow. Uh, what I'm really trying to educate people on is, first of all, there's only three things to look at is revenue growth, profit, and cash. Mm -hmm. And your whole business revolves around those three metrics. And from a revenue growth standpoint, a lot of companies don't even know what their revenue is. I know that sounds crazy, mm -hmm. but if you're in the agency space and you're managing a lot of media or you have a lot of pass-through revenue, people will tell me that their revenue is $20 million. And in reality, it might be $2 million or $3 million. Mm -hmm. And so what you what need to do is remove all the media aspects out of it. Now, in order to grow your revenue, there's only three things you can do. You can win new customers, you can renew your existing customers, or you can upsell your existing customers. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about like the investments you make, you need to know how you're performing in each one of those three areas. Mm -hmm. From a profit standpoint, there's really only two metrics to look at. There's your gross margin, and then there is what percent of your revenue do you spend on your overhead or what is called sg &A. And then from cash, there's really two things to look at. From a cash standpoint, you want to make sure that you have enough working capital or operating cash. That's enough money to pay your bills, your employees, and your taxes. And the second one is your rainy day and your investment fund. And making sure that you're pre preserving and putting enough cash away to take advantage of opportunities and to protect you for downside. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at it, uh, the business becomes really simple if you just focus on those three metrics. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned that you had an analytics test that you've implemented to even weed out the bad candidates. Uh, and yeah. then if they didn't pass, uh, I mean, you said 22% just in passing as well. I mean, that's must have been pretty difficult to even do so. Uh, so, you know, the, the problem that we have today in, in the in the job market is the difficulty even finding good people to apply for a job. And if you're also weeding out people because you're giving them this test, it becomes extremely difficult. So how were you able to attract a lot of quality people to come to you, and especially with your acceptance rate being very, uh, very low? So the key to our success and the success I recommend to pretty much every agency owner is we invested very heavily in the training and the improvement of entry level employees to get them to become managers or directors or VPs. Mm -hmm. And so we really focused on hiring entry level employees. It was very, very rare that we hired someone at a mid level from another agency and poached them to come to our firm. Mm -hmm. Our people got poached all the time to go to other firms, but it took us on average 19 days from the time a job offer was created to the time someone said yes to working for us. Hmm. And so by focusing on entry level employees and then growing and mentoring and teaching them and then giving them opportunities to get promoted, a couple things happened. First of all, you build a culture of promoting from within. And there are good and bad with that culture. 
I think the good far outweighs the bad. Mm -hmm. So the good is that you know that if you get into this company and you're doing a good job, that, that we're going to take care of you, you're going to get promoted, that you get to grow, that you understand the culture of the company and all those different aspects. The bad is really twofold. The first is there are many times we promote people before they are ready. Mm -hmm. And my general take on that is I could go spend six months to nine months to go find the right person, or I could get this person in that job and train them for six to nine months. And so I, I, that's the path we always chose. Mm -hmm. The second thing I was just going to say is the other downside is you don't get a influx of new ideas very often. So if you hire people from other agencies, you can learn what those other agencies are doing. And so when you only hire from within or mostly hire from within, you miss out on that opportunity for learnings. Mm -hmm. So obviously the biggest challenge in the, in the digital marketing world is uh, the, the, the industry is rapidly changing. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that you have to train them on. And then there's also the inherent benefit of somebody who had been in the industry long enough. So they have a lot of the ins outs of how things work and you know, best practices and things like that. So when you're bringing a lot of junior people, obviously, you know, time to value might be a very long, uh, long time, right? Because I think they're going to be spending a lot of their time learning and building their skill set before you can actually monetize their knowledge and expertise. So like, how, how were you able to budget for that, especially in the early days, trying to fund all these new hires, uh, probably not capable of sitting in front of a customer, giving recommendations on how to go spend their ad budgets in, in the millions? So there's a couple of things. One, we had our account management team and our client delivery team separated. Mm -hmm. So the account management team are generally your more senior people. They're the ones that are talking to clients. But then when you're on the delivery side, we generally had you being hired in a specific role. So you're being hired for paid search. You're being hired for SEO. You're being hired for social media. Mm -hmm. So yes, they have to get trained and up to speed, but we're not asking them to learn every single discipline all at once. Mm -hmm. We did have a rotation program. So if you were learning paid search, eventually you'd have the opportunity to go to social or programmatic or affiliate. But what I can tell you is my experience of training people is the first three months is this massive learning curve. And by the end of three months, they were able to talk to an unsophisticated person and look really knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. After six months, they generally could talk to a sophisticated person and seem intelligent. And by 12 months, they really became an expert within that field. Mm -hmm. And then the second year on year two, you know, the learning curve becomes very minimal after that time period, you mm -hmm. know, where you start separating, you know, someone who's been there for five years versus two years. I don't see massive differences, but you know, you, it's not perfect because, because, you know, as you said, you're getting someone up to speed. But on the flip side, it oftentimes takes six months to find somebody of high quality from another agency. So why not just get the some benefit now, get someone in the door, put mm -hmm. them on a path to development. And by six months, I've already mentioned, they can talk to an expert. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So obviously the agency world is very dynamic. There's a lot of changes happening in that space. What, are, what do you see some of the biggest challenges that are facing agencies today? I think there's a lot of challenges. So first mm -hmm. of all, I'm going to talk about what I, I believe are the three truths of the agency world. The first truth is that your employees want to work less and have you pay them more. Mm -hmm. The second truth is that your clients want to pay you less, have you work more and talk to more senior people. Mm -hmm. And the third truth is there's someone like me who wants you to have a 50% gross margin. Mm -hmm. And so every year you have to figure out how am I going to deal with this workforce that wants to get paid more and work less and this client base that wants to pay less, have you work more and talk to more senior people and the finance guy that is requiring you to maintain the same margin every single year. Mm -hmm. That is really hard. The second thing is, you know, with the entrance of chat GPT and AI, I don't think it's going to impact every agency, but it's going to impact a lot of agencies. Mm -hmm. And there are things that people can do now that they might not have been able to do where they needed help from an agency, but they might not need that help anymore. And so mm -hmm. I do believe that artificial intelligence 
uh, is an opportunity, but also a risk for a lot of agencies. Mm -hmm. So with those things that you've mentioned, what the expectations of the employees wanting to work less and get paid more and customer wants to pay you less and wants you to work long hours and uh, whatnot, and then uh, ultimately the pressure of you know being profitable. What are some you know effective strategies that you've seen, especially having built and successfully exited an agency and now consulting hundreds of agencies right in the digital marketing space? What are some things you've seen to work really well to build and scale an agency? So let's start with the employee base. Mm -hmm. Okay. The reality is that you're only going to have so much money. And what you need to do is put a raise pool together. That raise pool is going to be in the three to 5% range. It's not going to be like the crazy amounts of money that people are asking for. Mm -hmm. And you need to find your star performers and you want to take care of them. So you're going to use as much of that raise pool to get those people up to a certain dollar amount. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the dollar amount is today. But what we found for the longest period of time that if you were an entry level employee and we got you to $75,000, that the other companies were not going to poach your talent. Mm -hmm. And if you were a mid level director and you got your, them up to $150,000, that they weren't going to poach your talent. So you identify who are the ones that you want to get to this higher level of compensation so that they don't leave and so that they don't get poached. Mm -hmm. And then you just can't lose sleep if you lose an employee or not. You know, mm -hmm. I lost a ton of really good employees due to competitors offering them more money, but I only have so much money, so I, I can't just give it to everybody. And so going back to hiring entry level employees, you know, you just have to go out and invest in the next round, mm -hmm. maintain a good relationship with the people they leave. But, you know, like I had a, a phenomenal employee who was a year out of school. And someone came up to him and offered him, it was a holding company agency, I believe, to double his salary to run, you know, I think it was like the programmatic group or some, you know, division. Did I think he was ready? No. Mm -hmm. But he asked me what he should do. And I said, you should jump at it. Like, this is a huge opportunity for you. You're going to get more responsibility. You're going to get more money. And I was like, just make sure you get the mentorship so that you do a good job. But, you know, you can't chase over that. So that's one group. The second group, which is the client base, is you really need to invest in your pipeline and invest in sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. If they have all the power because you desperately need their revenue, they get to dictate the terms. Mm -hmm. But if you have a secret sauce, so I'd also say R&D, so like specializing in a niche, building technology that's unique for that niche, building and investing in sales and marketing so your phone is constantly ringing, changes the power dynamic. So you can say, look, if that's what you want to do, I can introduce you to some other agencies. Mm -hmm. And you, you'd be amazed at how powerful that is that hmm. once you show that you're willing to walk away, you know, it's like, no, no, where everything's fine. So, you, you know, now that doesn't mean that it doesn't always happen because if you don't have a good pipeline or if you don't have a strong differentiator, sometimes you need to keep the revenue. And then the, the last thing I would just say is there are things that you can look at, such as do you have too many senior people and maybe you need more junior people? Can you do near shore development? Are there things that you can automate? So there's other ways that you can improve the numbers as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously you said, you know, in our prior conversation before this episode, you've talked about how you had even very well thought out structure and how much of your uh, total revenue went into to sales and marketing. I think it was like 15% of your top line was spent on yeah. uh, on the sales and marketing side. And then obviously uh, you were trying to say everything in the 55% mar uh, mark, everything, because you were trying, your goal was at least 50% or so to our gross margin. So with those in investment into marketing, what were some of the things that you've seen? Obviously there was a couple of, you know, maybe a decade or so ago that you were building that company. So what were some of the things that you've seen to have work really well? Was it mostly inbound driven or were you doing a lot of events and big money you know, investment initiatives to, to really set the name and recognition of Rice Interactive to be well known in this space? So my first goal was to own Chicago. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make it so that if you were in the marketing space in Chicago, that you'd be familiar at Rise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a small company with a really small budget, when we got started, I was at probably every single networking event, every single night of the week, mm -hmm. you know, to get my name out there. And then as we started to hire more people, I required all of them to come with me hmm. because if you see 15 people at an event, you don't think it's like the whole company, you know, mm -hmm. you're like, wow, that's a pretty big company. And so I did that for a long time. 
The other thing that I did in the, in the early years is I really focused on channel partners. Mm -hmm. And what I found was, you know, especially web development companies, they didn't have any digital marketing at the time. And so they were very open to referring business to us in exchange for us referring back to them. Mm -hmm. And so we probably built 50 to a hundred agents or web development companies mm -hmm. to refer business to us. So that was a big part of our strategy. And then eventually we started hosting our own events and we started really going with an account-based marketing approach and switching to targeting individuals as opposed to waiting for the phone to ring from our partners. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on that account-based strategy that you seem to have work? Uh, was it mostly digital driven or were you doing more proactive outbound? It, it's both. So mm -hmm. it starts off with who are you going to call? Mm -hmm. You know, I'll use Ramsey as a good example. We are really focused on two million to twenty million dollar agencies. We we have a, a list of thirteen thousand to fourteen thousand of them. So mm -hmm. we are targeting those thirteen to fourteen thousand. But when you start having a list, there's all sorts of cool things you can do with it. You can do remarketing against that list. You can do emails against that list. You can do mm -hmm. sales outreach against that list. But the idea is that you want multiple touch points so that you can really figure out. You know, so you want multiple touch points so that they're getting hit everywhere. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're like, these are the people that I hear about on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. We also did a lot of events. We did our own internal events, but we sponsored a lot of events. I don't think they're great for lead gen, but if you go to the same events over and over and over again, and you're constantly seeing the Rise Interactive booth, you're thinking to yourself that, you know, rise is one of the major players in this space mm -hmm. so obviously like the the outbound strategy like you said so you create a list of target accounts based on the ideal customer profiles that you're going after and then your goal is to to be in front of them in multiple ways so that yep. they're becoming familiar with your with your brand and hopefully they either are in the market to buy something right now or when they are ready they recognize your brand and choose to exactly use Okay. I think on your LinkedIn profile, you mentioned you built your first, you know, obviously the rising tractor with like $10,000 and have it grown pretty successful in overall U.S. market uh, and had a successful exit. But you also mentioned something about your goal was 100% retention, which we all know in the agency world is nearly impossible because like yeah. you said, clients want to pay you less and make you do more and, and they inevitably will change, you know, vendors just to stay, you know, keep their agency partnerships on their toes, yeah. but what were some of the things you've done on the retention side and what have you seen to work really well? And were you ever able to successfully say you had hundred percent retention? Well, so it was hundred percent retention due to performance and mm -hmm. no, there are definitely times that we made mistakes, but we really focus on learning from those mistakes, making it better and improving on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Here's the first thing I'll just say is our business is really easy and really hard at the same time. There's four things you need to do. You need to win new business, keep that business, grow that business and innovate. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to renewing business, that's by far the most important of the four I just mentioned, mm -hmm. because if you can keep your book of business, your business is most likely going to grow as you add more customers. Mm -hmm. But if you have a leaky bucket and revenue is flowing down the drain, you have to work really hard on the sales team to make up for that. Mm -hmm. And so we put a huge emphasis on it. Generally, every year there was a, a roadmap of we, our mission was to deliver remarkable experiences uh, and superior results. Mm -hmm. And so we would talk about what are the things we can do to invest to make the results superior? What are the things we can do to invest to make the experience better? Mm -hmm. and, and I believe you really need those two components to be successful. Yeah. And I think we, there's a framework that we teach our clients as well. We call our growth formula framework is acquisition plus retention equals growth. Like you said, I think yeah. there's a lot of companies who are really good at retaining, but they're just so poor at ac acquiring new customers or on yeah. the other extreme where right. you have companies that just know how to, you know, acquire and burn, acquire and burn, right? They just keep adding clients and stick around for 90 days or <laughs> six months and they're gone. Uh, so they just yeah. keep, keep hunting for new, new logos and that's not uh, sustainable as well. Um, so obviously you've had a lot of those experiences, building companies successfully, growing those things. Are there any big lessons that you've learned that you, if you were to start an agency again, that you would say, hey, these are things that I would avoid uh, ever doing as an agency, or I would, you know, this, this is probably one thing that I would never do if I were to restart an agency. You know, a couple of things. One, mm -hmm. if there's 120,000 agencies in the United States, 
I'd spend a lot more time really understanding what makes us unique and what makes us different. Mm -hmm. And I, I want people to understand the difference between being unique and different and competent. Mm -hmm. Competent might mean that you do paid search really well, but it doesn't mean that you do it any better than someone else who's competent. Mm -hmm. Where having a real differentiator is something that you have that no one else has. Mm -hmm. And so if I was to start another agency, I would really think about what is my unique value proposition? What technology do I need? What investments do I need to make to make it special? Mm -hmm. So essentially yeah. you want to be completely differentiated from your competitors. So the choice is much easier for your buyer. And, yeah. and what about like, you know, obviously one of the common recommendations you hear is like you know, niche down, which I think you've mentioned earlier as well, the importance of really selecting a vertical to go after a certain sort of a market segment. Look, it comes down to once again, what's your unique differentiator? So what I like about niching down is that it's much easier to identify your differentiator. Mm -hmm. And you know, generally, if you're doing a good enough job, if you niche down, you should be able to beat all generalist agencies. Mm -hmm. So then you're really only competing with the, the other specialists in your space. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I would look at it. Okay. Like, especially in the early days, right? Like you said, we're, when you're building up a company, building up a team, you're trying to be a master in everything major and nothing could be extremely difficult to scale because you have too many product offering, too many yeah. different, you know, possibilities of things going wrong. So like, when do you realize that it's time to like super, you know, either get in the door, super narrow focused as a, as an agency versus a kind of a special, you know, a generalist, and then trying to win any sort of opportunities that are coming your way. When is it, you know, is, is the right time to say that I'm, I'm going all in on this one thing? I mean, look, if you look at my current business, I only sell to advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. You know, I've built budgeting and forecasting software for advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. So it's about as niche as you can possibly get. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still like, we launched the software two months ago. So it's still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. So what I would tell you is, I think the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. I can also tell you the reason why people don't do it is fear. You know, who am I saying no to by saying yes to only one group of people? Mm -hmm. But your win rate goes up, your differentiator goes up. And so it doesn't have to be a niche is your differentiator, mm -hmm. but you have to have some major differentiator and a niche is one of the easiest places to have that differentiator. Yeah. And then I think it also becomes uh, much easier to scale as well, right? Because your expertise yep. and your specialist, you're a specialist, so you have a lot more uh, deeper expertise in that same area. And I know you earlier talked about the importance of R&D. How big of a, a, a secret sauce was R&D at Rise Interactive, would you say, in helping you not only scale, but also to differentiate? So if you think about it, Rise today has 55 people on its product development team. It's about 500 employees. So that means that over 10% of the workforce is dedicated to differentiation and making them unique. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm very focused on if you're in a niche down, but you don't innovate, then you're not mm -hmm. really niching down. Like other mm -hmm. than having some stories and some case studies, you know, you really want to start thinking about what can I, from a service design standpoint, and what can I do from a product development standpoint, do mm -hmm. something that's really unique and makes you stand out. Mm -hmm. So obviously during the, the rises growth, were there ever a time you had to pivot as a, as the business evolved? And if so, can you share some examples of what those were? You know, I can share an example of a pivot that we didn't do, but like right as I was leaving, we were talking about mm -hmm. is that we started to win very large national accounts, but now all of a sudden we're getting invited to global international mm -hmm. accounts. And, you know, if you take like iProspect, iProspect has like 3000 offices or something like that across mm -hmm. the globe. And so it's very difficult to compete for an international account. And so our original philosophy was to have 50 great clients. As we lost one client, we'd replace another client with them. Mm -hmm. and the clients would become bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. What I found that was challenging was that you really needed to be global in order to be able to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. And so we were at a crossroads of like, our original premise was we only wanted 50 great customers. You know, do we now want a hundred great customers, but a lower ALV? And so we started thinking about those different criteria mm -hmm. in terms of who's the type of customer we actually want. Mm -hmm. Having built and scaled a service company, would you ever go back and build another service company? <laughs> you know, this started out as a service company. I will tell you now that I launched the software, it's really nice to be there for product support, be there to answer a question every once in a while. 
but the technology is the deliverable as opposed to like the team having to work for that deliverable. So one answer is maybe not, Mm -hmm. but on the flip side, uh, my true passion is soccer. Mm -hmm. And I can see myself opening a soccer club or a soccer technical program someday. And when you think about it, that's going back in it's professional service. It's just a different type of professional service. Yeah. I've interviewed a lot of people and I think the common theme is that <laughs> most people, have, if they have left the service industry, they don't want yeah. to go back into it. Uh, it's yeah. really difficult to do. Let's talk a little bit about you. So obviously, what are some of the things you do to personal development? Obviously, you've been you know, CEO multiple times, founder multiple companies. Yeah. You have to keep your mind sharp and keep growing your skills. So what are some things you're doing to personally and professionally grow? So I just started a challenge called 75 hard. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Mm -mm. So you have to drink a gallon of water a day. Mm -hmm. You have to work out twice a day. One of those workouts has to be outside. Mm. Both are 45 minutes long. You have to pick some healthy diet. So I'm doing intermittent fasting. I've given up fried foods, desserts, pastries, and sugar drinks. Mm Mm-hmm. And you have to read 10 pages of nonfiction a day. Hmm. And you have to do it for 75 days. My favorite part of the entire challenge is the nonfiction reading. Hmm. I, I've already thought about, you know, when my 75 days is up, I'm on day 29, what I plan on doing. And I plan on having it either be that you have to read 10 pages a day or some type of learning. It could be like, I'm trying to teach myself the piano Mm -hmm. or I'd I'd love to, you know, expand my knowledge in, you know, math and engineering. So I plan on continually doing that. Some of those things will be business related. Some Mm -hmm. of those things will be personally related. Uh, But I highly recommend everybody that your brain is a muscle and that you work out that muscle and that you are constantly reading, learning and pushing yourself to, you know, be the best you can be. Mm -hmm. And how has that, do you think, how has that helped you in terms of showing up in your role with uh, working 40, you know, almost 75 minutes a day? (laughs) You know what I find generally I have more energy, Mm -hmm. but you know, there's times it sucks. I'm not going to lie. I was at a, a two day, all day event last week. And one of the days I could not get my second workout in. So at 10 o'clock at night, it was mm-hmm. my outdoor workout. Mm-hmm. And it happened to be like 40 degrees. I was outside <laughs> working out because I had to get my workout in. Mm-hmm. So, and then the next morning I was up at 6 AM doing my first workout for the next day. Wow! So it takes discipline, mm-hmm. but I, I personally find it really enjoyable. Mm-hmm. But the fun part is you get to pick the books that you read. Like one of my books is B2B, you know, it's about B2B SaaS email marketing. Mm-hmm. So it, I, I don't think you pick a more specific thing to learn about than, mm-hmm. you know, that the other ones I'm reading about right now is grit and deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. And so you've heard of like the 10,000 hour rule equals mastery. Mm-hmm. This book I read called peak is actually the anti 10,000 hour rule. Mm-hmm. So you still need to do 10,000 hours, but you need to do it intelligently. Mm-hmm. You know, it goes back to my whole comment about how you spend your time and money. Mm-hmm. And if you spend your time and money intelligently, you're going to, you know, grow your income statement. You're going to make improvements. If you don't spend intelligently, you're still working in business, but you're not working effectively. And so it really mm-hmm. thinks about how you spend your time and money. What's your perspective on using some sort of a, a mastermind group or joining some sort of a group? And have you had that in your life that helped you, especially in, in those uh, years you were trying to build that, those, uh, the agency business? I don't belong to one now, but I mm-hmm. like right now I have Jim Bauman, who's the former CEO of Fowled Education, which he took from 500 million to 1.2 billion mm-hmm. as an advisor to me. And so he's involved in every conversation. I had Jack Kraft, who's the former vice chairman and chief operating officer at Leo Burnett as my mentor, really for my entire adult career. Mm. And so I've always believed in finding mentors, mm-hmm. but I also am a big fan of the peer to peer group. So I'm not mm-hmm. in EOO, I'm not in YPO, I was at one point. I'm not in a Vistage, but those are three great programs that I recommend quite a bit in terms of giving you guidance and, and pushing yourself. Makes sense. And obviously you're going through this challenge right now, so your, your calendar is probably pretty packed. Are there any sort of productivity hack that you have in terms of how you break your day to get stuff done and stay productive? No. I, I wish I had a better system, but I don't have a phenomenal system. I, I generally live in the rules of three and of the three most important things I want to focus on. Mm -hmm. And then generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll clear my schedule to go focus on those three things and then go from there. Mm -hmm. 
knowing what you know today, what advice would you give your younger self? I would say that understand the importance of the org structure and going back to the idea of A players mm -hmm. is where I'd really focus. If you have an all-star team, you're going to do great things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, it's a, it's, all, it's a team sport. Regardless of what business yeah. you're in, it is definitely a team sport. And you want, you want every sort of skills that will propel yeah. you forward and not, not make you lose the game. I, sure. I would also say, good or bad, at Rise, I spent a lot of time and energy on the 5% that was going wrong and not much on the 95% that was going right. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this business, I, I've really tried to switch it mm -hmm. and make sure that people feel the praise, the love, and show the appreciation for what they're doing and not let them overly stress about the 5%, mm -hmm. but learn from it and make improvements on it. And I, I think it's just a better leadership quality. And so I, I would say that I would probably share that with my younger self in terms of how to be a better leader. Most certainly. Well, John, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for sparing your wisdom with our audience. Thank you for having me on the show. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.